presentation about how to measure power consumption on uh, mainly SOC um, boards, so dev boards. Um, there's a lot of uh, not so good understanding about what that would actually look like because most of you are just software engineers. So the main part of the presentation is explaining the basics of the electronics. Um, just a few definitions and um, very quick and light explanation of how to measure things. Um, but after that, I'll show you some software based on the ARM energy flow and what you can do with it, which I think will get more interest in the So, first thing we know, we need the TI landing team for an RA. Um, and I'm a hardware guy. TI have been very interested in power optimization and a bit of it that we work with. So this work is kind of related to the stuff that we're doing for them. They have OMAP chips have a tremendous array of different power reduction technologies, but most of the support for it's not in mainline. Um, and if you implement it, you need to see that it actually works by measuring the power. So we, um, we needed a tool like the stuff I'm going to show you. So these are the sections. First part, I'll talk to you about what voltage, current, and power actually are. Then explain what measuring them looks like. Then talk about the arm energy probe itself um, and how to wire up your dead board to work with the arm energy probe. And there's a pretty important section on how far you can trust these numbers. If the thing spits out magic numbers, you shouldn't trust magic numbers. We've talked about that. And then software-wise, there's a command line app that you can wire up to commute blocks and get nice graphs. And I'll demo a HTML5 WebSockets canvas real-time uh, user interface. Um, using Chrome. Okay, so here's the, the rough stuff. Um, so we've all heard of voltage, and uh, every time you buy a battery or um, have an AC adapter, there's some mention of voltage. It's pretty much like a bunch of electrons that want to go somewhere else but can't right now. Um, and how strong that desire is, is the voltage. So, um, in a battery, they squish all the electrons down the minus side, but they would really like to go around and get the plus side. So, measuring the volts, um, in SOCs, we only deal with small voltages, that's not the dangerous one. Um, usually it's above 700 millivolts because this is like the magic um, voltage for a transistor switch and otherwise it can be made cheap. Um, USB power is 5 volts. IO on an SOC is 1.8. LED is 1.2. BDR is 1.3. ARM core somewhere between 0.9 and 1.6. And the lithium ion battery is. Three point seven, three point eight, and we can measure those kind of things. And I'll give a voltage kind of Load is what we basically put in the way of the electrons. So we let them get to where they want to go, but first they've got to go through our panda board or whatever else. We've got to do the work. And the load changes in ohms, or R, is distributed. Current is um, a measure of how many electrons are flowing through the circuit. So it's measured in amps. Um, and uh, in, sometimes we use I in a formula to talk about current. How much current flows depends on the voltage and the will of the electrons to push through and the resistance. And the kind of worst case is a short where there's no resistance and maximum amount of current that can find 
Tired, so we can't put us current measurements. And if, if you have a USB 2 device, the maximum allowed current for it is 500 milliamps, that's half an amp. For a USB 3, you increase it to 900 milliamps. So, 5 volt adapter that we all know and love might have 2 amps at 5 volts. An LED that's lit up might take 1 to 10 milliamps, or so it can take more. And a lithium ion battery like in the phone might have uh, be able to provide 2.5 amps. <coughs> different from amp hours. Um, amp hours means the battery could provide 2.5 amps for an hour. That's its kind of promise. So, power. Now, this is the, the one why I bother to mention the rest of them is to define what this is, because this is the one that we actually need. It's the current flowing times the voltage. Um, so if the voltage increased or the current increased, the power would increase. And in fact, because of the equivalence of the formula, if we halve the voltage, the power goes down by four. And this is why DBFS is um, so important in the power saving, because it does much more than, um, than just changing the voltage. As measured in watts, uh, and from previous examples, USB device with X, 5 volts, half an amp, that comes out to 2.5 watts, etc. Uh, etc. Et so, why do we talk about power and not current? Um, the reason is that the amount of current that flows depends on the voltage. So, in an SOC system or a development board, we have many different power rails at different voltages, and then we can't compare the current that flows, because if it was a higher voltage, less current would flow, but actually more power is used. So it's important that we convert all of our numbers to power watts uh, before we report them or compare them, so that everything is apples to apples. And we can't get away from it, because in the end, we want to know how much of the power that we provide the whole system is taken by pieces of the system and the voltages are going to be different. So conversion to watts is be critical. So uh, yeah. so here's how to um, measure these things that we talked about. So the easiest thing to measure is the common mode voltage. So what that actually means is uh, one particular point of the circuit, here is this D ground, um, is designated as like zero volts. The reason that's important is that voltages are actually a difference between two points. So they're all kind of relative. So that's a panda board ES PC input jack. Uh, and the minus side of the jack is what we call zero for that system. So common mode voltage measurement is just uh, referring the voltage that you want to measure to the system zero, measuring the voltage very easily. So you can also get an ammeter, um, which is basically a voltmeter, but instead of measuring the voltage compared to zero, measures the voltage across a known resistance. And because of equivalences uh, with Ohm's law, you can determine from that how much current is flowing. But the more current flows, the more voltage difference there is across the resistor. <coughs> Actually, you can do the same basic trick by moving the shunt resistor out of the ammeter and actually onto your board. Um, so that has some advantages, but the signal, the rail, isn't very interrupted. It just has to go through the resistor. And if you're not measuring, then everything still works because the resistor is there and it flows through the resistor. So to measure power, given what we said before, we have to break the power rail, put a shunt resistor across the brake, 
Uh, have one volt meter that measures the rail compared to more volts, so we know the voltage of that rail, and another volt meter that's across the shunt resistor that is measuring how much current is coming. So that gives us voltage and current, and because power is voltage times current, we can figure it out from that. So these resistors and things that I was passing around before, um, these are various kinds of resistor that you might use as a shunt. Uh, the big square one um, is hundreds million, um, and it's able to take a lot of power, to dissipate a lot of power itself, which becomes important for very, very high um, power So. The important criteria is to choose the shunt that is able to show voltage that your voltmeter can measure. So an arm energy program can measure up to 165 millivolts. So there's a cheat graph here that um, tells you if you know the maximum current that you expect to measure, um, say 1.5 amps, you can find out the resistance of the shunt that you should use, which is 100 milliamps, uh, and the power dissipation of it is about a quarter of a watt, is okay for most resistance. So it's quite easy to measure current like 1.5 amps. So normally, Brown Energy Pro, um, if you've got a specially high uh, power rail, you want to use. Um, 220 million, maybe one more. But most of the time, you, you can get away with these small SMT uh, half ohm resistors. And under some circumstances, um, the voltage across the resistor is lost to the mode. So normally, you keep that voltage small enough, nothing cares. But for example, with a DBFS rail, the whole voltage there is only like 0.9 volt. So if we take uh, 165 millivolts away from it, it's going to crash the CPU. So you can play a trick where you choose too small a shunt and only get a maximum voltage smaller than the maximum you can measure. So, um, what we're actually measuring is normally a regulated voltage. So our rail, for example, say a 1.8 or 3.3 volt rail on our board is being driven by a regulator chip. So a higher voltage comes here, and it acts to keep where the blue spot is at exactly 1.8 or 3.3 volts. It does this in a kind of loop. Um, uses the sense input to assess how it's doing at keeping the voltage right. If it should dip there, then it will make more of the input available at the output bring it back up. Uh, so this works fine um, if your load is near the blue spot. If you mess with it by adding external ammeter, for example, <coughs> this regulator has to keep this perfectly fine, but what's at the other end of it with a changing load isn't regulated properly anymore. So you'll crash your SOC. In newer chips, um, <coughs> they provided at the SOC an output from the DOM directly where the load is that you can use as a sense. And this cuts through. Um, the inductance that's between the regulator and the load, so you get perfectly regulated action at the load. So the reason it's important is um, we would ideally like to have our shunts somewhere up here, but in the case that the regulator <coughs> is simple, um, we may end up reducing the quality of the power of the SOC to the point of crash. So mostly, what we do is, instead of measuring the thing we're actually interested in, um, 
we measure the input to the regulator. So any power that's used over here comes from here. So we'll see. Uh, <coughs> the difference is that uh, we will also see the efficiency loss <coughs> of the regulator. So regulators are built for certain loads to be very efficient. Somewhere like this, it looks like uh, 87% efficient, so long as you've got 200 million load. If the load is less, that it can turn to crack. So you're seeing that loss of efficiency in your power measurement as well. But actually, that's not too bad because you can't make a real device that doesn't have these losses. So measuring them isn't uh, uh, telling you anything that's wrong. So, um, measurement bandwidth is interesting as well. Um, obviously, these processors are operating like 2 gigahertz. So, actually, their load, the amount of energy they need, changes during each 2 gigahertz clock at the edges of load is the maximum. But we can't monitor power rails at 2 gigahertz um, uh, bandwidth. So, what we've actually got is 10 kilohertz bandwidth, so 10 kilosamples a second on our energy probes. Um, and because we're typically measuring behind the regulator, uh, actually this is fine, it's enough. So the regulator already modulates, it, it has its own switching frequency, which is only a couple of megahertz. Um, and it turns out that we can capture it on just with 10 kilosamples. So on these boards, the SOCs, there's what you could call a power tree. So power comes in from the DC jack, uh, kind of at the start, but then there's a set of regulators, sometimes a few deep, uh, that provide the different voltages that are needed uh, throughout the SOC. So what we would need to ideally do is add shunts um, everywhere. And with this information, we can um, not only see who's taking which power cleanly and separately, um, but we can have an opinion about the regulator efficiency. So we know how much power went into the regulator, but we also know, if we add up all these, what the um, load was, so we can figure out how much power was lost in the regulator. It's also very bad. So there's four basic um, things you want to do to your development gear for heavy power. First is externally um, instrument the DC input. This is the easiest thing to do because you don't have to cut up your board line. Um, however, what the information that you get from that is kind of open to interpretation because it's everyone's on that board's use of power turns up in that one number. So um, it's difficult to figure out what you're looking at with that. So what's more effective is to um, wire up uh, measurements around the regulator. What this is showing is that without interrupting the output, you can actually estimate the current of the output while knowing the voltage of the output. So if your regulator setup is too sensitive to place the shunt in the output, <coughs> uh, this trick will let you know the current of the input and the voltage on both sides and determine the power that's used on the output without actually interrupting. And what you would quickly want to do is to um, instrument all of the inputs to all of the SOC <coughs> regulators. This is from a Panda board ES. Um, so this is the input chip. And uh, you can see that several um, regulators are involved. Actually, you want to know the new. So this one, for example, is <coughs> 1.29 volts that goes to the PDR 
uh, actually that's a really interesting one to look at. I'll, I'll go into that. And the perfect thing, actually the origin uh, is, is the only one I've seen do this. They broke the power tree into 14 and placed the shunts on the border road, which is like absolutely perfect for this. It makes life very easy to observe all 14 rails. Um, and you can answer then questions like, how much of your power goes on your GPS when you're not using it? See, and if you've got a 3G module, what's the average power <coughs> when it's idle but still in contact with tower? WM, HDMI, all of these are ready instrumented in origin, so I was very jealous when I saw that. So I got the mm -hmm. So, this is a kind of what I've got here um, with nine. Uh, rails instrumented, nine power rails, and we'll be seeing results from that live and later on. But that's that's what your board's going to look like if you do this stuff with it. It's going to be uh, connectors glued on the side of your board and magic wires going off to shunt resistors go elsewhere on your board, and then enough arm energy probes to cover the kind of view that you've got. So, the arm energy probe itself, it's got <coughs> three, um, what you could call, chains. Um, but the advantage of it is you can just pile on as many as you need, and they appear as TTYACM. But there's no ID on the probes. Oh, it's actually better. I didn't know that. No, super. Yeah, yeah. yeah actually, they, they should have serial numbers. Yeah, that would really solve it. But yeah, yeah no, that's, that's, that's better than I need. Um, yeah, so they are actually pretty cool. Um, now, all of the information that I said before about the electronic side led up to understanding this. So, one channel uh, is um, two voltmeters. One of them is good for common mode voltage measurement. So, between zero and your rail, you go up to 30 volts actually, but we would never use that. The other one is has got an amplifier in front of it. And it can measure between 0 and 165 millivolts. <coughs> and it's good for measuring across your shunt. So that's one channel. So the whole thing looks like this. There's a single shared millivolt reference. And then these guys would go across one of three shunts uh, and measure the whole lot and give results on USB. So I hope that, that gives you an idea of what that thing is now. It's like a magic set of voltmeters, that's what it is. <coughs> so, how to um, wire up your board. This is the last hardware section. So, you need to look at the schematic for your board, or get someone else to look at it, and find out what's a good place to put your shunts. Estimate the size and resistance of the shunt so it's easier than it sounds because it's very uh, glue one of the headers <coughs> that you can plug your energy probe onto uh, for each of the energy probes you need. Wire up the stuff, uh, place the shunts. So, I we don't really have time to go into this thing. So, this trick makes it a lot easier than it sounds because it's very common that the input to a regulator, that's this L10 I'm talking about here, uh, has a inductor. Um, and what it's for is to stop the switching noise of the regulator uh, radiating back down to the power cord. Um, so actually, it's not that critical if you're in the lab or something. You don't have flying an aircraft, you know, 
body. Um, so you can do this trick where you simply remove the um, surface mount and butt uh, and add your shunt in the same place. That's how I did the angle one. So you're willing to measure the input side of the regulator to keep it on. Um, then uh, this, this is the way you want to go. So the Arm Energy Probe connector um, cares which about orientation. Basically, it wants the white lead to have the higher voltage. It doesn't flower up or anything, but it won't give you the right one. But, uh, so here's a, um, a little project I did just before I came here, which is building DC, um, just the DC jack shunt. So basically you plug your power into this instead of the board and then plug the other end into your board. And you can plug your arm energy probe on the little thing open up the top. And this is a 100 million 5 watt resistor in the green so it can get down on the probe. Or you can do the same actually on the board. Uh, so basically what we've done is cut the the conductor for the plus 5 volt side and inserted the <coughs> and that leads off to one of these 7 pin connectors that probe and plug onto these so you glue them on wire them up <coughs> and bring the wires back to your shunt resistor. So this used to be L11 lift there, which was our inductor for the input side of the regulator. So basically removed it and replaced it with a half own shunt. And that, that works super well. And sometimes you've got a rail that has very high currents and the little SMT chip resistors can't over it. So you can just solve it with bigger <coughs> This is a one watt, um, 120 mil thing. It's just the same, it's just a good thing for this and heat. Okay, that should be such a um, So, okay. Um, these things spit out numbers, and if you're not wary, you just trust the number and tell people the number that it told you, especially if they're like mega precise. It says it's one, two, three point four five six milliwatts. The temptation is just to report it. But actually you should treat them as bullshit by default really. So any numbers coming out of these measuring things are highly, highly suspect. So if you if you do test and you observe it um, being repeatable. Uh, so on a different board or a different channel of your measuring device, or they, they keep saying the same thing. Okay, so that's, that's a good sign. Um, if you compare your total system power of DC chip to the individual things, and they don't add up, <laughs> like they say they draw more power than you're giving. Uh, um, and also knowing what zero is is quite hard for these systems. So if you know that the thing's turned off and there's nothing plugged into it, you leave it a while and it says that it's drawing current, you see the truth. So um, generally, uh, and we'll go into an error budget in a minute, um, you should just give, assume they're a rough idea at the start with of what the truth is about power, say 10 to 20%, plus or minus 10 to 20%. And um, you can find out that number if you've got absolutely accurate uh, lab gear, which is quite expensive, but that is worth having, because you can compare what it says to what you know. And these are like 0.001% absolutely accurate, you know, but you understand. <coughs> yeah, so repeatability is um, critical to get trust in the numbers. If you can't repeat it the next day or repeat it on another board or another energy probe and get the same number, then you, you still are measuring it. It's just a random number. And 
here's an example. I live in Taiwan, um, so room temperature for me is like about 30 degrees at the time this was done. So uh, this is a system that's not plugged into anything, it draws no current. So it's doing pretty well, reasonably offset, but it's a day at the beginning. Then I turned on my air conditioning, um, and after 15 minutes it was convinced that everything was drawing 2 milliamps, which is obviously portion. So you don't trust these numbers too much until you've had experience with them and seen them do the right thing. So the shunt resistor cares about temperature. It might self heat, um, making that worse. There's uh, different kinds of resistor. Equipment. The ADC that measures it cares about temperature. The amplifier on the arm AG5 cares. There's picks to minimize this, but on the building. Uh, you can get made with some iron actually seen that. Uh, common mode error was really surprising. So the amplifier that measures the voltage across the shunt shouldn't care about the voltage of that shunt compared to zero. It should absolutely reject it. But when I measured it with a lamp multimeter, which is absolutely accurate, see it can be practically fair. Uh, I was very surprised to see that. The silicon itself is about its temperature in terms of how much power it can take. So this is something running CPU burn starts here um, and it's left for 10 minutes. It's pulling 23% more power than when it started doing the same thing at the same clock rate uh, due to the heating of the silicon from, it was from room temperature to 60 degrees. So, repeatability is affected by the <coughs> temperature of the silicon. And to make things worse, on the arm probes, they're not matched. They have made no effort to match them. So, here is a measurement across 12 pro different probe channels for um, 3.8 millivolt shunt volt. So, this is what it should be telling you. And I verified with a lab multimeter. And this is what it did to me. It's completely different depending on what channel I use. I mean, that is like 43% error. So I added software correction, um, but this requires assessing the channel performance, which I think is probably not going to do. This, this is only a problem at low currents. At higher currents, it becomes much, much more accurate quite quickly but there's possibly to correct against that. But even when I correct it, it's 13 to 9% percent um, average. And when I took my lab multimeter and visited each of these lines, so these are the common mode voltages and the various cross-shunt voltages in a 2D map. This is the correction map that came out. It should be a flat surface um, but it isn't. So again the software is adapted to use these correction tables to bring the quality of the numbers up. So this is the last bit of this um, the error budget. Uh, when I talk about 10 to 20 percent as a rough ballpark this is one and so the shunt resistors themselves vary from five one percent uh, they care about temperature, it's 300 parts per million per degree centigrade for food um, And the problem of the different channels giving different, reporting different numbers for the same situation as well as it's like plus or minus 10%. There's other errors to do with temperature and so on. So I think mean, absolutely, uh, if you set 15% accurate, you, you, you can use Okay, so there's a command line up. Um, basically, this takes the TTY ACM protocol data, which is 10 kilo samples per second for every channel, giving voltage and current uh, measurements. It decodes it in the protocol state machine 
uh, correct it for offset and smaller narrative and <coughs> synchronizes the results from multiple probes, so just reports one activity across all channels. Um, and this app then has a separate port which um, takes them and spans out and stands it out. So uh, new plot plots this um, and you can make pretty pictures with uh, new plot. It also takes care of um, config file which defines uh, the shunt resistance that you put for each channel and takes yes. names and stuff like this. Does it do more how to do with my yeah, 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 yeah. So actually the CPU goes up, but, but here, what I've shown in a minute, I've got three energy probes plugged in, and it, the config file has three sets of data columns. Um, and that's all So now we finally get to the interesting bit. <laughs> um, so from that same uh, library, um, there's a tool with basically a network interface poking out of it, uh, which is a web server um, and a web sockets server. I'll generate this a little bit while we just have that kind of um, So we have the same deal here with the kind of interpretation and capture of the content of the uh, energy probes, but then we have a demon who's um, capturing all of the sample information to a spool file. A spool file gets very large, like a gigabyte or so for a few minutes, um, and exposes or allows access to the spool file information across a WebSocket interface. So, put into um, easier to understand terms, you go to localhost colon 15, 16, 4, um, you get given an HTML file. The HTML file contains scripts, and the scripts don't make WebSocket connections at the daemon, and the daemon spams you with sample data for the things that you're interested in. The next the WebSocket side of it is real time, so it's like a very responsive user interface. And at its fastest setting, um, you see all the samples in real time because it's quick enough to update the canvas so that it can show them all. Also, it's not um, specific to ARM Energy Pro. If you've got something else that's giving you voltage and current uh, information, you could wire it up to it the same and then use the WebSocket user interface with it. And all of the samples are in that spool file. Um, and you're basically moving your browser view around, scroll it around the spool file. It's different than a scope. A scope just shows you what it captured in its little view. But this is moving the view across everything, the whole kind of landscape. Um, so the spool buffer um, uses a scheme <coughs> where no matter where you start or where you end, what the stride is, uh, you can get an instantaneous average across all of the 10 kilohertz samples that are between. So the numbers are always to include everything that is in between. Um, Okay, uh, this won't make any sense until I've done it. So, um, I think it will uh, be convenient. <coughs> when you talk to our lava team, I haven't talked to our lava team in the time. Did he listen? <laughs> 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 um, oh, no. <laughs> Oh, so we're just going to the bank now. <laughs> so Origin did, um, much to the credit 
Now it's the first time I've ever taken out and saw a load of chunks, and I thought, I know, someone knew, someone knew the right thing to do. Um, but uh, no, it's a problem. Uh, Lidar is not a hardware organisation, and there's little understanding um, that it needs to be a bit more. So. Um, yeah, I mean, let's say let's say you had a five dollar budget. Uh, and you had a chance to call your vendors, how do you do it? Where do you do this thing? I'm on shunts, yeah, and, and the connectors for our major card would be perfect. Then you could just plug in your gun. But actually, if they place the shunts, that's 90% of the problem. So it won't cost them even $5, it's just a problem. Okay, so. Yeah, so yeah. Um, actually, the pandas, they put one shunt um, kind of early in the power tree, uh, which is something. Well, yeah, it's something. Um, but actually, what Origin did showed that they truly uh, want to allow people to understand where the power went. And this, this is what we really want to know. So, this thing. <laughs> yeah. So what we're looking at is, um, you can see the power tree listed out here. So DCN is like a parent uh, of these other uh, rails. He's like a 5 volt input jack. And here's the black um, uh, trace here. He's because he's the parent, he's kind of in the background, uh, and his children are piled up, one on top of the other, uh, in front of him. Now, that's quite interesting because this gap is the um, parent power that we don't have an explanation for. So it's the stuff that we don't, we know this much of where the parent power went, but we don't know that much. Actually, I know what these are. These are the heartbeats of the uh, These little things are actually just the, the cost of running the LED. So, on the user interface, we can change time. So, this is the see everything all at once. This is the 10 kilohertz base, and you can see it jumping up and down with the heartbeat LED. But it looks very noisy because um, we've piled them one on top of the other. Their individual noises are maximised and there they are. Um, as we decrease the phone base, uh, they become less noisy because we're averaging the, um, all of the samples in between. So we can wind it right back. <coughs> then it looks very smooth. But each one of these pixels is covering like uh, 5,000 samples on nine channels. And it's a dynamic and accurate uh, average. So we can also see individual channels. This is um, EDR power. And change the scale. For that, these measuring calipers can also be moved to at least stop the acquisition. The numbers on the right uh, represent what's between the calipers. So, if we take this high region, we can see that it's like 41 milliwatts, and uh, low region. is 37. So it's possible to put numbers against features that you see uh, from the factory. Is it something I said? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so um, also this will be um, enhanced to have uh, 
triggering. Um, so I don't think they like the colors. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you can choose the colors in the config file. <laughs> don't um, yeah, also the calipers are useful because the distance between them is precisely measured as well. So if you see a feature, you're able to uh, measure how much time it takes. And the uh, next feature that we'll have is the trigger level will um, fade out bits of the capture that don't meet the trigger criteria. So you'll be able to find um, uh, regions, say, of high current, and just measure the time that involve those regions. Uh, about things that weren't active during that time. Yeah, you yeah, can, but it's different because um, you're working on an already captured buffer. So it's more like a search or, or a find where it lights up all the matches. What is the delay between the you have um, recorded or something, and you just play when you just it. I guess it's like 50 milliseconds. It's very oh, yeah. quick. If I pull the power, I'll put the power in, I see it in the middle. So another use for it is measuring boot timing. This is kind of ODS booting. So in this region, it's in new boot. Um, and these are the various things that happen during the kernel boot. Uh, and this is quite difficult to do another way because we truly measure from power in, whereas most of the other things are measuring from kernel boot, uh, or maybe not so nice boot. So this is far more accurate uh, from what you can do from inside. And all of the software's downloadable now from uh, it and um, works on uh, Chrome and it initially worked like our Firefox but it became, it became slower as I went on with Chrome and so it's much more problems. And um, it's useful for other uh, measurement sources other than our monitor That's it. Yeah, you did start with Yes. Yeah. Um, um, it's an ARM energy code, and yeah. you have ARM software, you can use it as a right? If you don't have DS, you can use these. Or if you have the same output. I think this is bad. But I'm, I'm, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, I think you're asking the wrong question. question. I was asking. Yeah. 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 Or you can do uh, you, you, If you've got spare channels, you can wire it up to LED and you'll see that the voltage change in the heat produced there. So it could be extended for that easily. But the heartbeat LED thing is quite interesting. It leaves a very noticeable, visible kind of signature on the total power. So actually, if you want to mark the beginning of something, you can just do something violent with the power. Make it like spin like crazy or something. And then do your thing and maybe mark it down. Uh, and we could use that as a trigger. Yeah, I think that this talking about, I was going to ask this, you can have a serial input into the game that your software can use. And then oh, you a serial port and say start profiling and profiling, and that would show up as markers in the, in the buffer, for example, that you're in the region mm -hmm. of the software that you want to. Didn't think that. Yeah, no, it's quite possible to do. 
Yeah, so you can have start and end markers, for example, yeah. in, in the software that you can really interested in. No, no, no. In fact, I was correcting the demo which also could be interesting, but the lights is delayed. So, I don't know how. Sorry, you're. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. 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 But you need, you need to provide a known. Um, so, you need like a, to basically build a known load uh, and measure it, and then. I provided three kinds of probe response that I got, and you match it the nearest one fraction. No, 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 no. It's a tough guy. Yeah, it'd be like half an hour. Yeah, you build the thing, measure against it for each one, you just have to sit there plugging things in. Ambient temperature isn't critical, it's, it's the die temperature. Uh, you know, and, and most things will tell you now, you need to know it. Well, but the die temperature really isn't positive. Yeah, you're not correct. No, but he, he's in lava, so he's thinking, Frank, my numbers have changed depending on whether I just ran the CPU for it depends. That depends on ambient temperature as well. No, it's pretty general. Some of the big fan in front of every board. Well, yeah, there's all around there. We have to walk to it. These are. Okay. Then put up and put in the point. Yeah. Another word. No questions? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, me, I get it from the law. That's uh, of cool. So, um, if a new group moves in, so you need to go to uh, ARM. Now, previously, ARM wanted to tie them to availability of PS5. So they would give you one if you had PS5 devices. Actually, these are like gen beams, once right? you have one, you want to have more. But then, and I just, for one board, I want three to see what's going on. So that, I don't think that's really workable strategy. So we, we talked to them and they sounded like they would be like, a bit more. Uh, and they, they cost around 200 dollars. So uh, you need to contact Army. Oh, you can now. Yeah. Um, just, uh, a few hours. Yeah. You have to read. Well, it's a bit easier off the first one because you, you have like a production line, but you have to identify where to go in and uh, find them. They're not all marked properly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you, you probably don't need to instrument uh, Azure. You know, if you go as the DC chat, if it suddenly is wildly different, then yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but to understand what code is doing, yeah, I promised I would talk about DVR just briefly. So we found at TI, um, we changed the DVR controller to auto uh, self refresh after some time up period. So if you don't use the external memory bus, um, the SD RAM will go into um, self-refresh and save power. But we found that when we enabled the HCI, uh, it talked on the external bus enough that it wasn't able to go either. Now, unless, I mean, I could see this view that I showed, and I can see the DDR fan up as soon as I put the CI modules in. So I said it's bloating the DDR power. But if you only have the 5 volt input and you saw it go like that, you've got no idea. <laughs> you could just as easily think that was the HCI popping and you wouldn't know. So at least having one per board fully instrumented for people to understand I 
that's right now. I'm just cutting it off. Okay. I'd like to use the to make it as a I don't think you guys want to use Actually, polling the ATY ACM is quite expensive. So, on my laptop, the three channels, the thread or the pool, the process that does it is like 60% of my pool. Yeah, um, it, it, it's not the polling, it's all the crutching. <laughs> it has to go through all the crutching table to adapt the thing properly. So actually, Tiago are interested to make a kind of current of how I'm measuring clients out of the camera uh, with maybe one or two of these plug in that's kind of plug in go and you, you filter over the network with the browsers and you get the syntax. So they can deploy it internally to people who don't know really what's going on, but they can just deploy it and connect to it and they'll get numbers. Um, but maybe yeah, for this particular arm energy probe, as as the values of the current decrease, the quality of the numbers goes right down. So it's only as good as it is because of the fraction. And the fraction is really complicated.